So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our viewers, and welcome to our latest Expert Talks webinar. My name is Abby, and I'm co-development success manager at Virtuous, a leading content production company that specializes in game development and 3D art production. I'll be your moderator, and today's topic is how to tell a story through concept art. Allow me to introduce our expert panelists. First, we have Ying Ding, concept artist at Ubisoft Montreal. Hello. Uh, then, we have, <laughs> then we have Nicodemus Madison, art director at NetEase Games. Hello. And then last but not least, we have Nicolas Ballet, lead concept artist at Virtuous Montreal. Hello. So thank you all for being here. We are live um, and this panel or this webinar will be recorded and will be uploaded later to our YouTube channel. Um, and let me just set this up. Um, allow me to share my screen. Hmm. Give me one second. Okay, cool. So, oops, sorry. These are our talking points for those of you watching, um, which we'll be go going over in the next 45 minutes or so. First, your interest in approaching concept art, why we need to think of storytelling when doing concepts, the role of a concept artist in storytelling, collaboration to explore a story to its fullest, telling a clear story through concept art and how much details are needed to tell a story. So, Let's kick things off by getting to know our panelists. And our first question is, what made you interested in concept art and what is your approach? Ying, would you like to kick us off? Oh, yeah, for sure. So hi, everyone. My name is Ying. Uh, as uh, Abby said, I'm currently working as a, a more specifically character concept artist um, at Ubisoft Montreal. And I started playing like a lot of um, online MMORPG as a kid. And um, I actually have like a background like in China. I grew up there until I was like 11 and then moved to Canada. So I was kind of exposed to a lot of these like uh, Korean Chinese online games. And I watch a lot of anime. Um, but back then there was no like, like the idea of concept art was non-existent and I, I just wanted to be a manga artist uh, and that didn't play out um, but then I had the uh, there was like internet and I browsed a lot of uh, CG hub DeviantArt and then there was um, like CG society as well and I kind of discovered this online forums of community of digital artists and at some point I messaged uh, a, a cosp artist uh, through their website and asked them about like a how do they do this as a living? Because I, I kind of had to go to university and choose something to do for my life. And they told me all about the world of concept art back then in 2011, I think. Um, and then um, that's how I kind of got into this and had my interest, like learning that you can actually do it for a job. That's You can draw for a living. That's That's all I need. That's pretty cool. Um, and my approach usually to concept art is I want to um, iterate really fast and try to explore as many ideas as possible and narrow it down later. I use uh, quite a bit of 3D software to support my process. And usually my daily job, I try to solve problems and I try to make a cool story, go above and beyond, hopefully. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Cool. How about you, Nicodemus? Um, well, it's, um, I started out, you know, like I think many concept artists do, um, being, having a fascination for games. Um, I belong to the 8-bit um, generation. Um, uh, so, you know, at eight years, at, at about eight to 10 years of age, I, I started playing games and, you know, drawing pretty much what I saw. Like a lot of these 8-bit games are platformers and, and hence, you know, whatever drawings I made came out as fairly flat sort of side-scrolling adventures um, in books. Um, I grew up in a, you know, small industrial city in, um, in Sweden and there was no, no idea or no, no, um, 
you know, uh, notion of who made these games or that it was even a career. So uh, at some point, you know, in my later teens, I started understanding that, oh, someone actually makes these games and my drawing might actually be, be something that I can elaborate on um, as, a, uh, as a career in the future. Um, and so I um, took up a college uh, education in Sweden, and this was, you know, early 2000s. Um, after the IT boom, um, a lot of interactive media institutes and so on and so forth were opening up all across Europe um, and learned more about 3D and 2D and texturing and um, the sort of game pipeline um, as, I, uh, as I went through my, my 20s. And um, yeah, essentially, that's my my story on how to get in or how I got into the industry. Um, with regards to approach, you know, I try to be as um, tool agnostic as possible, you know, trying out new software where I think it might serve a purpose. Um, the um, I still rely a lot on my uh, art fundamentals and my understanding of art history, uh, because that has helped me a lot in just deciphering what I see, which is uh, an important thing for concept artists. Um, you know, trying to build a visual library and finding keywords and writing and designers notes um, and just sort of building an understanding of whatever you're supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. um, but try to represent in a visual manner so um yeah mm -hmm. that's it pretty much cool. <laughs> thank you Nicodemus. and what about you nicholas yes uh well so i've drawn for as long as i can remember but it was always kind of a pastime for me um i grew up on like reading french science fiction comics there was a good there was a good period with Moebius and Bilal and all those great artists that really kind of let me focus on, uh, give me a feeling of like the focus on the world building and how they were, uh, how they were creating worlds that lived this, inside these artworks. So it's something that I always appreciated. Uh, but I went and studied architecture before having the chance to switch to movies in 2009. Um, but I'm I'm glad I studied architecture. It's a kind of it's a tool set and scale set that I use in my day to day work all way, like all the time. Mainly because I it allows me to tackle different scale at the same time, uh, bridge several system into one design, and I often try to bring as realistic consideration as I can when I do art. Uh, so that defines my general approach to concept art, which is basically design oriented and very systemic. So I'm trying to find logic structures into all of this and interweave them into creating a final design very that's, cool that's mostly it and then i i um like to finish this i switched to games in 2020 pretty much and that's and now awesome. i'm your truth <laughs> yes uh thanks everyone now that we've gotten to know our panelists i guess we'll move on to our next question which is, why do we need to think of storytelling when doing concepts in the first place? So um, who's taking this first? Nicodemus? Um, <clears throat> well, it has to do with the role of the role of the concept artist as well. You know, like um, the role of a concept artist is pretty much at, at least according to my definition to um, work with designers and writers um, and the idea of course to visualize something that ne don't necessarily come off the page um, super easily and, and try to assist in production um, and visualize results um, before they before they end up for example in the 3d stage um, so why do we need to think of storytelling when doing concepts? Mm, well, the, it's a good question. <laughs> so the, the overall ambition, right, is to make sure that a story, um, a story being hammered out by, by designers and writers um, it's like a, a visual 
pillar, um, something to stand on, um, so that the story gets conveyed in a more um, in a visual fashion, so that it actually creates immersion, at least in games and also in movies. Um, uh, and for that reason, you know, um, it's it's important for a concept artist, for example, to talk a lot with uh, designers and also try to bridge bridge gaps um, of creativity in between different fields that don't necessarily have that um, organizational natural connection. Um, mm -hmm. Also, you know, as the saying goes, an image an image can tell you more than a thousand words. And I think that um, is really important, even though a bit cliche. Uh, I, think it, I, I think it still applies for um, a lot of the work we do as concept artists. Mm. Yeah. And in general, I think to just bounce on what Nicodemus was saying, it's concepts are usually about ideas and story in, in general, which means that if you're just creating a pretty picture that doesn't sit within the project, it's not going to hold attention and it's not going to be interesting for the team. You you want your viewers and team members to get lost in the concept, to start to infer and fill in the blanks and make it um, more relevant as it go on. So trivial or not, the story in the picture will always keep the people engaged. So that's what you're trying to achieve when you're doing concept art. It, you're trying to kind of filtrate uh, and create a filtrate the ideas and try to assemble them into something that feels coherent um and in general like concept art is never like oh you do the drawing and then it's over it's it's always a question of iteration it's part of the work you have to redo and re rewrite and redraw a lot of the times and by understanding the story you're going to be able to target those kinds of iteration and respond to what the writer the game designers the modelers can or cannot do um, so you're kind of creating a feedback loop. You're, let's say, the, the, the meeting point, and then you're allowing everybody to do their job better after. Um, so you're just like, it's understanding your position in the process. That's the most important part. Awesome. Ding. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, kind of go from the point of uh, when uh, Nico Dimas mentioned about the role of like when you think about storytelling, you want to think about the role of a concept artist. Like I think in into like boiled down to the very simple essence, the concept artist's job is to solve problem. And I think anything more than that is good to have, but not a must have. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, just because you can do the bare minimum doesn't mean you should like I, I love to go above and beyond so people who can tell a story has an edge and a lot of people can make things look good like make pretty pictures and stuff but not a lot of people have good ideas and good storytelling skills and uh, if you can do that your portfolio will definitely stand out not just to like companies but also to you know your audience if you ever want to be uh you know more than like uh like you can be like your own brand and stuff like that um but yeah like having storytelling in your concept is it's a good to have and it definitely helps you to become more employable and from a production standpoint i think it really inspires people on your team to believe in the project and into the world building, you know, there's not everyone has a lot of knowledge on projects sometimes, especially with work from home and seeing your concept and making it feel more relatable through storytelling definitely help like, like uh, knit people together um, into a, like a team effort kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everyone. All right. So uh, we talk about storytelling, obviously, and um, now let's get deeper into it. What is the role of a concept artist in this storytelling? Um, I guess. Oh yeah, Ding. I'll Wanna... take this oh, one. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think I just mentioned like role of the concept artist is to solve problem, but, uh, but uh, that's kind of like the job title. But um, the role of a concept artist in storytelling is really to, you know, kind of add that extra emotion um, into like this, uh, the, the narrative, whatever you're going to receive that you need to kind of 
paint into your drawing, but at the same time, you are going to give all the information that, you know, modelers, um, character modelers, uh, for example, for me, I do character design. So, um, you know, you want to give them the information like this character is wearing this code because, um, you know, it's passed down to them from their parents and it's really worn out and because they, it's, a, it's an old coat. Um, so, and then you design the character, but they don't just live in a vacuum. You kind of need to do a bit of a concept, like narrative storytelling with your character. Like, okay, my character is going to go fight others in the in this environment. Does it look good? Does it does it like does everything mesh well together? It's also kind of like a test. Um, so it's a little bit of everything together. So your job is to see test out does do they work together at least from like the character side of things um and um yeah inspire others bring out the fun really like you know like if if the work is just work but you can make it fun as well uh, so kind of like I, I did this picture for far cry 6 i think the idea was to kind of show like that location that they were partying in but i had the idea of like doing some weird prank um, with all the character and the story that they had and then um, just to get the mood and we were trying to sell this party mission to the like like to level design and it worked out mm. and it was fun yeah yeah definitely get that party vibe uh, it's a really <laughs> funny picture uh thanks Ying um Nicholas <laughs> yeah uh, sorry for the wall of text uh basically the, <laughs> oh, good. there was some things that I wanted to uh talk about like my my main approach to concept art before we talk about story which is mainly that concept art is usually an umbrella term for any image des based design work so it can happen in any part of the project so knowing which moment in the project you're doing it so initial development pre-production production design or post-production is gonna decide what information is important for you to convey and what your what's going to be your target and mm -hmm. the main the main goal there is to understand that concept artists are there to fail faster and cheaper. So rather than starting a whole production, you're going to get one artist draw for one or two days, get get back some ideas, and then you don't have like to go through a full production cycle to, uh, to know if it works or not. That means that our job is as much as giving solution as asking questions. So in that logic, if we jump on the next slide. Mm -hmm. We are often one of the first steps to translate an idea into image. And we often think about like, oh, you know, concept art is about finding the perfect design. But I will usually think that it's about finding a logical solution, yes, but it's also reflecting the culture and the history that built it, meaning that it's going to be the story. Uh, if you're thinking about like real life example, like a city, a city is never built in one, one like, one big design plan and it's just like here you have your city um so i there's a picture on the top right of Chongqing because it's a place where you have a lot of uh, uh you have a lot of mix between like the old city and the new city and you're following the old streets like you never just create something out of thin air um mm -hmm. so it's never isolated which means you need to be able to tell that story you need to be able to um or if it's not told by the writer or the designers, it needs to be at least inferred by yourself and think about like, hey, what can I do to make it more interesting? Um, so the, this is the first part. And the second part, which includes the little, two little Star Wars image in the, in the bottom, uh, is that deciding what is a problem is also a story. Uh, and the joke is Star Wars always had a Thing about missing handrails and having platforms with no security next to big weapons and for me it's always been funny because we always notice it because we're used to seeing those but also you can actually think of it as a design and a storytelling point the empire doesn't care about the safety of the people running the machines mm -hmm. they just care about the machines so you can actually start doing some world building and when you see it appear in the first movie it's just there people reacted over the years and when you're seeing the new series, The Mandalorian, uh, people are actually commenting on the fact that it does not, like there's no handrails and it's silly. And people who have problem with it are the people that are outside, outside of the empire. So for me, this, see, 
this is small details that makes uh, the interest of concept art is bringing those little details that will enrich the story you're trying to tell. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And I've then, never noticed uh, that before. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's part of the discussions that happens in Star Wars fan group. I guess. Sure. Yeah. Um, in for I'm <clears throat> citing another example of our own. Uh, of my own work uh, before. So I worked on a movie called Wandering Earth. Um, and basically, we, when we talked with the director, we were trying to find like what the tone of the, what the look of the movie would be. Uh, so we established that it was mainly about mach machines take, overtaking um, the importance because the project became more important than single human lives. So we basically pushed everything to all the machines are dwarving humans in terms of size and importance. So we have always, like you can see on the on the right, there's a little guy on top of the platform. Um, so the job, our job was always to say, okay, how big can we make this? How how can we like slide in humans to live into the in between of those machines? And for us, that was part of telling the story because we are giving. To everybody the keys to understand that the machines are more important than the humans living in it because mm -hmm. it's humanity it's not like you like a single person survival that becomes important yeah interesting Nicodemus anything to add um yeah a little bit I mean when working with concept therapists you um or or me being a concept artist as well you you um you start to sort of understand how much how much legwork there actually is to do in coming up just actually with a still image um, in achieving the visual storytelling um, component that relies on visual pillars. So, for example, you know, into into any still frame image uh, or any uh, any film as well, you have to you have to go through a process of understanding, you know, the ideas of uh, color theory. Uh, different shape languages, uh, how camera lenses work, contrast and, and juxtaposition uh, of characters or sizes, uh, you know. Um, there's this great book that I can recommend that is called um, A Visual Story by an author called uh, Bruce Blocker, who did, um, which I read in college, uh, that outlines this uh, quite well, uh, both for films and for games. Um, so the role of a concept artist in storytelling, I would say, is not necessarily only to nail down, you know, the contents of the image, but also to sort of shape the, shape the frame, right? Um, understanding what components go into that frame and how to create the compelling visual um, using, using art fundamentals, exactly. Um, so... The role is not only to, you know, inform 3D modelers, like Nicholas pointed out, you know, like to make the um, make the um, the process as smooth as possible or as efficient as possible, but also to provide that level of, how should I say, um, visual understanding uh, that might not necessarily be all that apparent to uh, to um, artists later down the pipeline. Um, so yes, like a visual, um, a visual oracle of sorts um, <laughs> might be a good word for it. Yeah, makes sense. All right, so you talk about your role, and usually you're working in the context of a larger team, right? So how do you collaborate to explore a story to its fullest? That is our next question. Um, Nicholas, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, uh, yeah, like the, the main. The main thing I usually think about is an idea is always perfect until it's tested. So you always like, you know, you write down something on, on a page of paper or the game designer or the art director, and it's always going to be perfect in his head and it makes sense. And when you actually get to draw it, you actually realize how much adjustment you have to make. And this is why iteration comes in. Um, so there is kind of a there is kind of a need to be very reactive when you're doing this because you're going to have to be choosing what information and elements to prioritize and trying to understand what is into the realm of possibilities. But it's also into, into where can you 
uh, where do you want to guide the project? Because obviously people will always be reacting to concept art. And I'm not, doing, I'm not saying this in terms of you yourself. What you're trying to do is create a feedback loop with the designers, the writers, the client, if you're doing freelancing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it will help like reflecting what he's doing. So as I cited another example from Wandering Earth. When we're doing the engines for pushing the Earth away from the sun, uh, if you haven't seen the movie, the premise is completely crazy, but our goal was to try to make sense of it. And we really quickly nailed, nailed down like the, the themes of the story and tried to um, react to it in a very blunt fashion. So we, we took plane jets, we put it vertical and we put big structure around it. So it's the center, center one on the right. Uh, if you go to the next picture, it becomes a little bit more apparent. Um, and basically that was the final design of the, of the engines, which was, it's literally just an engine from a fighter jet that is vertical with giant legs to hold it still. Um, and this allowed us to basically choose what, what was going to be the, 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 like the look of the movie. Um, and basically that came from feedback loops from the client. The client has an idea. We're Pro, like we're suggesting ideas and we're trying to simplify and choose what is important. And what was important for us was, like I said before, the, the theme of technology over human lives. So we, mm-hmm. we simplified it to the point where all the gribbles and things like that are just machine related, but the big shapes are all things that you know. Uh, so for us, it was a lot of skim, skimming on all the ideas that were in the script and just reducing it to something that uh, felt we could uh, have a proper understanding when you're looking at it. Um, I had a very quick example too um, on the next page, which is basically a very classic a classic game. So it's from Homeworld uh, that was made in 1999. Um, back then, really often, the designers used to be the guy modeling it also. So there was a very tr- the, there was a very straight line from the design to the uh, to the final product and because it's a strategy game you have a lot of uh, units on the screen so all the designs were focused on the silhouette that makes it very unique and memorable so all the ships are very quirky silhouettes and all the details are very um, uh, surface level details meaning that is very easy to approximate when you're doing texture so that that was basically the artist knowing what's going to come next because we're just one step in the process. So we have to make sure that the ideas we're pushing and uh, this, the kind of story elements that we're trying to bring in or, or images are relevant until the final product. Mm-hmm. So back in the days, it was easy to, to, to understand because often it was the same guy doing it. And also the budget for like polygons and what your engine could and cannot do was very limited. So you had to take drastic choice, but I think it's still a knowledge that you should always keep in the back of your mind when you're doing something. Mm-hmm. Cool. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. yeah, Ying. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, to the point, uh, you know, like collaboration, actually, it's, it's a really important thing in concept art. Like, I think a lot of times concept artists might like work more um, uh, a little bit more isolated like you know they're in, in the in my workplace sometimes it's like oh don't don't talk to them let them do their thing let them do their thinking and they're like a you know like some animals like in the in their bubble but it's actually not always the case and I do think we should look at it in a different way so why collaboration is uh, something happened on on my time on um, when I was working on Far Cry 6 and I was tasked to make guns a lot of guns I had to make so many guns and I, I personally am not an expert at weapons I didn't know how it worked at all but I had to make them um, then you know you we might be wondering like what are you going to do like you don't know anything about guns you're going to draw a bunch of guns um but here's why collaboration is important um we had to make a lot of weapon skins for stories that happened in the in the in the game and there was a guy who believed that there's aliens um 
that exists. I think they probably exist for real, but in the game, there's a guy that believes aliens exist and we wanted to make a gun for that mission. So um, me and my art director, who was actually an expert at guns, his name is Greg Rostam. You can look up his work if you want. He, t- he taught me everything how a gun works. Um, and we had another teammate on, uh, who was a 3D modeler, a weapon modeler uh, named Adam Brown. And he loved to pitch ideas to me because he sits next to me before and then he would be like, why don't we make like an arcade themed guns? That would be so cool. And, and then we just start to brainstorm with, with him and with the art director. And we had um, gameplay animators as well who brought a fake gun to work. I think it's like those airsoft guns that you're allowed to kind of bring those. And we just brainstormed a little alien gun the afternoon. And then everyone was sitting in front of screen and just like, maybe, maybe we should put some coin slots on it or something, some life bars in the back. And it was actually a lot of fun. And what I'm trying to say is um, you have to use those resources around you, like people around you, they have so many ideas and experiences that perhaps you might not have. And as a concept artist, you have to keep an open mind and listen to, you know, what people around you has to say or like what their expertise are. And you can really create something that is not just about you. It's like really like a piece that's made with a lot of people's ideas. And the process is a lot of fun as well. So that's a uh, that's what I did, uh, collaborating with the other discipline. Yeah, sure. thanks. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, I think Nicholas um, hinted at something that I have observed um, primarily for the past ten years, and that is that the all the tools we're using, primarily for making games, are becoming so much easier to um, to get into. Um, for example, if you look back 15, 20 years, there was no Unity, there was no Unreal available to the public where you can you know, learn um, how to do certain things in a new medium, which you are not necessarily familiar with. Um, there is now, well, nowadays, you know, like um, you can let concept artists into level designs um, and have them move stuff around in Unreal if you, if, if you want to. Um, so the definition of a concept artist becomes a little bit blurry um, when it comes to you know, um, defining the actual role. Um, and that is also where collaboration comes in, I believe. Um, because as I previously mentioned, not everyone necessarily has a, an education in art history or has taken drawing lessons, life drawing and stuff like this. But um, ever since the advent of, of you know, um, the, the availability of game engines and easier and easy software and stuff like this, um, the, um, the, uh, the, the venues for collaborations have opened up a lot. Um, and, and one thing that I would actually recommend any concept artist who might be listening, um, who is either starting out or has been in the industry for some time is, you know, um, even if you um, um, even if you have work and you sit eight hours or more a day and and uh, and draw at a company somewhere, try to formulate your own your own IPs, you know, in your free time or in your spare time, um, and draw a lot at home and explore different kinds of different kinds of software. Experiment with ZBrush if if you're into characters. Experiment with Unreal or Unity if you're into um, well characters or environment actually um so you learn more about how to actually utilize that software um like one of my primary goals for the past i would say almost 10 years is to close the gap as i call it it's essentially to try and 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 reduce the creative chasm in between what is traditionally called a concept artist and a 3d artist in order to make more kind of generalists that are able to elaborate on each other's ideas and to to um, work more efficiently together. Um, and as an AD and as a coordinator of of, uh, of artists, um, I think that uh, that is a really important thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, makes sense. Um, 
All right. So moving on to the next question, how do we convey a clear story through concept art? So I'll take okay. that one. Yeah. Um, I, I think like, uh, so you have the basics of like visual communication. You need your, your uh, you know, your concept art to be clear, readable, and that you have a good understanding of the story before you start. Um, and even before you start your, your work, I think it's really good to take some time to just really think about it, write, write down your ideas and kind of like don't rush into the drawing, do a lot of research. Um, I, I think that will really make your, um, make your drawing like a lot stronger than just rushing into it. Um, and uh, you got to have the right, think about what kind of mood, what kind of, um, you know, time of the day or angle that you want to choose for, for that sketch or that multiple sketch you're doing. And um, I'd say like, you should also have a really good um, understanding of human psychology, I guess, like just looking into like books like that, especially, you know, color theory, like what, what color, what shape um, invokes like, uh, like kind of thoughts behind your viewer. And knowing more about that is going to help you a lot to like uh, compose something that has some kind of symbolism or visuals that gives the viewer like, oh, I know what's going on. And, you know, like, you got to remember that sometimes simplicity, like sometimes less is more and you don't really need to have too many things in your drawing, but it could be a challenge because in, in video game, at least video game industry, they want to pack as much information as possible in, in like a picture or in, in like a concept. And, you know, for a character, you have to draw head to toe very clear. So the 3D modeler can know like what is going on. Um, so yeah, I, I think less is more, but it, it could be out of your control sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, on that note, um, I think that ambiguity in concept art also serves a purpose. Um, when everything is not clearly defined, you also open up not only um, not only for the artists uh, who will be working with your concept, but also it in order to embellish, but also for the viewer. Um, you know, um, like like you said, like it's. Um, I think as well, less is more. I think it's a very good term for it. Um, that that you allow for the viewer to actually fill in the gaps, to fill in, you know, uh, some of what is hissing in in the background, for example, um, with her own stories. Because I think that that happens automatically, regardless of what the artist is intending. The the audience will always apply some level of interpretation to a work. Um, so, um, and also much like you said, with regards to the typology or archetypes, like using these in an efficient manner so that we can, that we can, you know, um, use the heroes in a, in a, in, in a proper way in an image, for example, taking the hero from, from a Jungian typology, um, or that we can identify which of the side characters is a sage or which of the side characters is a wizard and so on and so forth by essentially using the visual, um, the visual, um, the visual tools at our disposal. Um, hmm. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Nicodemus. And Nicholas. Yeah, it's, it's going to be going in the same direction as, uh, as Ying and Nico said before. Um, mostly it's by knowing and studying the visual language because this is what we're using to communicate. So uh, we often, when you're going through formation and learning how to draw or things like that, we learn a lot about composition, contrast, density of details, all those things. Uh, the thing that we often forget to bridge is that it's not just technical fundamentals, it's also storytelling fundamentals. Like you can actually convey you con you are conveying story by the choices you are making. So I I put this painting by Water uh, Waterhouse of uh, Marianne leaving the, the judgment seat of Iran because it's a perfect example of how even in classical <laughs> painting, they are using those same tools to 
actually guide your eyes and understand the story as much as you can and infer what's happening. So uh, it's always very interesting uh, looking at how, how all those contrasts are kind of working together and what you see first, second, and third, which is something that you should uh, like pay attention when you're designing a keyframe or something like that, which is uh, what do you want people to focus focus on and what doesn't need detail? And you're going to see that even in this drawing, even though it looks very detailed, it looks very classical and perfectly painted, there's a lot of areas that are just like left, that are left uh, very simple. And that for me is just like focusing on the story's aim. Once you have like the main elements, you like the top and the bottom are just there to let just the, the image breathe. But like all is happening in the center, in the center level of the pic of the picture. So in general, it's often about what can you remove from the from like the details to just focus on what's important. So this is just like story's aim. So removing the cool details that are useless and just keeping the important stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the other point I like to touch on is usually like the importance of idea association and recognizability. Uh, this is like just two screenshots from um, researching like those words in uh, on ArtStation. So a thing that I found that is really helpful when you're trying to tell a story is every elements that we encounter, every objects, every environments, every characters, we can often describe them as an archetype. So the minimum recognizable characteristic for an object, where if you're saying an axe, we all know what an axe is. It's a weighted blade on top of a stick. If you're saying a castle, it's a fortified building with walls and towers. And once you know this, you know what you need to make it recognizable for everybody. So you can actually start having fun and bringing your own story. And this is what's going to make it unique. Um, there's a saying in concept art often that you have to do 80% known and 20% uh, invention. And the thing is, it's not about the audience not being uh, intelligent enough to understand what you're doing. It's mostly about you're trying to communicate something really quickly because you're spending a week on an ax, but the viewer or the player is going to spend five seconds looking at it, but he needs to understand what's going on. And he needs to understand the story. And if he wants to stay with it, he's going to have that story, you know, fed into the model later or something like that. If he decides to spend the time with it, so mm -hmm. it most of the time it's understanding those rules and trying to apply them when you're doing something. Which um, it always helps to try to say, okay, what am I trying to convey first? And then if it doesn't fit the if it doesn't fit with that story, you can remove it. Or you know, make sure that it you see it second or third, depending on what you want to do. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah much so, like um, I mean, yeah, much like Nicholas has said here, it's it, it's the same um, it's the same principles involved in doing science and stuff like this, right? Like s classical semiotics. Um, if you want to indicate where the bathroom is, you have to use a specific shape language. You have to use a specific kind of language to indicate where the exit is in a building, where the toilets are. Um, arrow, an arrow in a certain direction is, a, is an indicator that movement along those lines will lead you to a specific place. And, and we're essentially using the same thing when we're making concept. Uh, we're relying a lot on our our viewers' ability to interpret uh, reality, but also when it comes to stylized and more fantastical work, we still have to we still have to rely a lot on um, what we assume that people al already know. Um, so, so it it's a really good point, I think. Yeah, and in general, I I've put that example where the goal was to try to come up with a realistic kind of design for a, a tug spaceship that would carry things here and there in the space station and basically it carries stuff so it has two big claws so it's very quick to understand oh you know it's going to hold the thing and i'm not trying to hide the function i'm just saying like almost all of the spaceship is going to be those two big claws and when hmm. you then see the cockpit in the front which is very close to what a crane uh, command station is nowadays 
then you can understand also like the fact that it's kind of a worker equipment kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's it's a little bit like what Nicodemus said. It's like reverse semiotics. You understand the simple thing so you can actually play with it. Um, and then on the other side also like to create those kind of fake brochure trying to sell the product like you're seeing on the on the painting, which is part of the world building for me because I'm trying to uh, give hints of what the story could be behind those and let people just like um, just infer and imagine what it could mean. Yeah, it's very cool. I imagine that will inspire other folks on the team as well, right? Um, Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. So moving on to our next question. Um, how much detail and what sort of detail of the concept um, is needed to tell a story? Um, that's you again, Nicholas. Is it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so in in general, I think the clarity of intention is the key. So it's not so much a number or a, a quantity. Is if you know what you're trying to say, you won't need to say too much. Um, like concept art is about suggesting more than solving everything at one hundred percent because you're not going to be the one solving the final product. You, most of the time, we're a cog in a bigger machine. So we're going to give it to modelers and modelers have a leeway of actually doing their details and working with the, the working with the model, the topology, and then there's going to be texture, there's going to be VFX, all those things are going to come later. So you don't want to get them stuck into something that will not be uh, solvable. Um, one of the thing that I usually focus on is trying to balance time and efficiency. So if you know your team, if you have a, if you have a very efficient team that's able to understand what you're doing, the most random scribble can be understood. Um, splash art, the ones that we see most of the time on ArtStation, like the really nice pictures, are there to sell a finalized vision of it. So they are very detailed, but most of the drawings we do in our work is usually very sketchy. And we're trying to fudge the detail as much as we want, uh, as much as we can. And we're trying to trim the fat and focus on the main idea. Um, I like to point out like the example of the classical art, um, for example, like John Harris on the side, which he was doing everything with, uh, with traditional painting, meaning that he had time for drying. He couldn't like just correct everything or liquefy or free transform everything in Photoshop, meaning that he had to focus on the story first and the clarity and everything that he did not need, he just had to just skip it in order to achieve the most powerful result he could do. Mm. Uh, which is often my last point, which is avoid the trap of cool. We like to put cool stuff in our art. Uh, and then sometimes <laughs> we just put cool everywhere. But if everything is cool in the end, then nothing is because it's all at the same level. So uh, most of the time it's focus on what you need to do. Um, just around, like, if you're looking around you, 90% of what you're surrounded with is not designer friendly. It's mostly like things you piled on, you know, kind of create your own little world. But then maybe sometimes you have like 10% where you really have like control on it and you try to make it as perfect as you want it. So you have to think about that too, in terms of how you create concept art, which is give a little bit of leeway and try to focus on what you absolutely need to do. And if there's stuff you can skip, just go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, on this, um, on this point as well, with regards to clarity, um, and also to tie back a little bit with regards to collaboration, um, one of the things that some concept artists tend to forget is the fact that if you run around in a game, like a third person game or a first person game, um, the player essentially has control over the camera. So you have to curate the frame in a very different way than you would have if you're making, if you're making an animation or a film, for example. Um, and for this particular reason, um, there might need, it's like for any given asset, you might need more information in terms of rendering, orthos, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, with regards to the pure co content specifics of, of uh, how much detail is it, um, it's a hard question to answer. It all depends on, you know, the level of stylization we're talking about and 
also like uh, Nicholas mentioned, the uh, the amount of time we're actually able to uh, to put into any specific concept. Um, time is, you know, usually a luxury. Um, so when it comes to uh, when it comes to trying optimizing that, um, you can either solve it through making callouts, which saves you a lot of time, and you just have to make sure that you point some arrows to certain elements of a character design, for example, here is leather, here is metal, so on and so forth. Um, uh, so speed and efficiency as well is a, is a, is a good consideration. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool, yeah. Awesome. Ying, anything to add? Yeah, just uh, wanted to add some last points. Um, well, when I was doing character concept art, sometimes they would ask me to put the characters in context. Like, okay, we have this main character and then we need to see that this person is is like doing a bunch of things or they're like, uh, they're robbing a bank or for example. And then we, we want to see like some, a few ideas like, in context basically in the story like how does this main character rob the bank for example and the amount of detail i have provided to my art director could be very surprising to you um sometimes i just pull like stock photos on the internet and i would show him a lot of just pictures on google like so i think we can rob rob the bank from this angle or we could like rob the bank <laughs> from the backyard so i showed him lots of photo reference just to get the idea. And I think it could really be as simple as stock photos, but there were also times I had to show designs of the character. Um, and, and sometimes we communicate by drawing almost uh, little ugly stick figures, like just line art drawings. And, you know, I, I think the level of details you need to tell, a, well, you might be asking like to tell a story, but on the design of the character, we try to tell a story with the accessories, with the expression, the posing. So um, it could be as simple as line art or just a few tones to tell like what's the contrast on the character. So it, it's like as, you know, as little as you need to sell your idea to your client or, or art director, you really don't need a lot of brush strokes, but it depend depending on your, um, on your client, there are people who really cannot understand the idea unless you show them a fully rendered um, character or like a scene for them to understand the story they really need that so sometimes mm -hmm. you might need more sometimes you, you you show your stock photo and they they get it right away and I, I think it really depends and um, yeah so it, you, you have to listen and read your our director or like superior and see what what do they need to understand your design and, and stuff like that so yeah cool that's all all right yeah like super interesting stuff very insightful thanks so much we are actually now time for our q a uh, portion so folks for our audience um please enter your questions into the Q&A portion and our team behind the scenes will be selecting uh, some questions for us to answer here. If you have anyone in particular, any one of our panelists that you'd like to direct your questions to, please mention them in your question. Otherwise, we'll just go around the room. Um, all right. Ooh, cool. All right. First, let me stop sharing my screen so you can see your faces. There you go. All right, we have actually, oh, we have a couple of questions in here already. All right, first question is from Alzo. Thanks for the talk, very insightful. When it comes to storytelling, do you have a hierarchy between characters, environments, and props concept art? Um, is one more powerful than others to tell a story? Anyone wanna take this first? Um, I think I uh, naturally. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, sure, sure. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to take this because I actually did uh, all of these <laughs> before, and I tried to do storytelling in all of them, um, but I, I don't think one is more powerful than the other in a neutral way of speaking. I, I think like character, environment, and props, you can do you can do storytelling on them all. However, due to the nature of 
the way that human beings are attracted to things. Um, I observed that people are attracted to characters um, very often more than, let's say, environment or a gun. I'm not saying people are not attracted to those, but there are many people who, you know, when you put a lot of things together, they look at the faces or they look at the character. So I, I think visually, a character in an environment, people tend to look at the characters more. But it doesn't mean that there's no, like, you know, there, there's like a real hierarchy. It's just two people. I think like characters are easier to tell a story than environments and props in my personal opinion. But yeah, Nicodemus. Yeah, I mean, it, it probably right. depends on what kind of game you're, 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 um, you're working on as well. Um, for example, I imagine your, your argument being correct if, um, if, um, if you're working on a very character driven and sort of story heavy type of game but let's say a fast paced a fast paced fps for example multiplayer now it's not that that's it's not necessarily the best example in terms of a storytelling perspective but um with regards to what makes most sense in characterizing on the screen you know you want to you want you want to have an understanding of what gun you have what gun the uh, the opponent has and how these play out against each other and and this needs to sort of be visually represented as well so um in short i think it depends on what you're working on um uh, you know even even when it comes to creating you know dlc and and um and and items for microtransactions so there is most likely there is most likely items that you need to be able to focus extra attention on in order to make them sell or in order to make them desirable for players and and so that could maybe be be a, a consideration to take um when making these items um yeah so so Overall, yeah, I agree with you. I think characters are most likely um, are most likely the most important, but they're also there is also most the most likely other considerations to take in, into account as well um, with regards yeah, to the hierarchy and importance of certain items from a storytelling perspective. Yeah, there there's usually a bias too, but I will there there is often like moments or games or movies that we have examples where like the storytelling is achieved by um, um is achieved by an environment for example or a prop and often we're gonna say like oh you know like this and like in this thing like the environment is a character too uh this is often like how most people react to this i'm thinking of a game for example like control uh that came out not so long ago where the most memorable thing about this is the architecture of that office building where everything seems mm. like the most banal thing, but it gets crazier and crazier while you're going in. And it's treated like a character because we have that bias of trying to bring it close to our experience. But if you're doing a good job, you're always going to get to that point where you're actually able to tell story through concept art. Um, I should have picked it up, but there is a meme uh, going around like for a, uh, you know, um, environment storytelling where it's just, it's an electric panel on a wall. And then there is, there's just like a, a ashes on the ground in front and shapes of feet. And then it's like story, like environmental storytelling with you don't have a character, but you understand that the guy got electrocuted and probably burn his shoes or something like that. And it's a silly joke, but it's a good example of you, the absence of character can tell the story too. Uh, so I don't think it's really a hierarchy. It's more about what what kind of tools do you have for each one and what kind of story are you trying to tell? Mm. Uh, if another example that's maybe a little bit more um, uh, indie gaming, there's a game called What Remains of Edit Finch. And it's a story about characters and their personal story with no characters. You're just visiting their houses. And all of the rooms, all of the environments that they inhabit are actually completely different and reflect their personality. So you have the impression you're spending time with them, but you're actually alone. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. All right. What is our next question here? Um, 
So we have a couple. Um, Anonymous is asking, hello all, do you guys make a difference between storyboard and concept art? I guess differentiating between those two. Does anyone have anything for that? Uh, yeah, so actually we're kind of, I kind of have this going on at work right now. <laughs> but um, storyboard is different. Uh, like kind of like a little, it, it's kind of different than concept art. And I don't think, oh, I don't think like, um, I don't know if all the concept artists enjoys doing storyboard, but storyboard, it, it can be really, really rough just, uh, and, and you need a lot of them and a lot of time they need it for the story, they need it for gameplay. Um, it's not really about the design. That's the difference. Like concept art is about the design, and then storyboard is about like show me like what what what's going on at this angle. Um, like how how is it flowy? Like the whole transition. So I think like yeah, one is about the transition, one is about the design. That's the difference. And um, I, I know quite a few concept artists who doesn't want to do storyboard, and then sometimes they don't know the difference, and they make the concept artists like you can draw. You do the storyboard, okay? Like, uh, and then that might happen. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you guys have yes. I mean, I'm of a yeah. Go ahead, Nick. different opinion. Yeah, I'm of a different opinion. To me, it's just essentially you just draw. Um, you know, like when I when I worked with um, Axis Animation, um, what we used to do was like we we made storyboards. And whenever there's a scene cut, you make, um, for certain scene cuts, you, you make those um, into color keys just to define the color of the, of the segment. And then for some of these keys, we would go in and actually do actual key art, a, a very high degree of rendering. The process is virtually the same. It's just you spend less time on, on, on most of the frames. So, with regards to with regards to the actual difference in it, it's a matter of definition. Me personally, I just see it as work. Um, it's just essentially drawing. You're 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 using the tools at your disposal. Two D, three D, colors, shape. You know, it doesn't really matter. Um, but that is my my own highly subjective <laughs> viewpoint on this subject. Sure. Yeah, I think the. It's a little bit like, again, like that kind of collaborative act of kind of piling up all those different views, um, like very good, um, very good story borders. Uh, usually, even though like they're doing like very, um, very simple drawings, they're going to talk about camera lens, they're going to talk about how do you approach something, especially in movies. Um, meaning that they are going to talk about like what things look like and how things are told in the in that world it might not be about like oh you know that's that's the car that they have that's the style of the car even though that sometimes can happen depending on where you're at in your project but just like choosing your camera is not an innocent uh innocent move you're actually trying to focus on something and show something which means that it is also storytelling um so because of that, it is part of it, but I make a difference of it because it like while concept art focuses a little bit more about like, yes, that's that's the cool card that is in the frame. And we are completely open to the fact that the framing will com be completely different and that the environment might change and there's going to be a lot of iteration. Uh, storyboard most of the time is about like telling the story and focusing only about like what are the beats telling the story then sometimes it comes back and the color keys like Nicodemus said uh, just earlier where sometimes they, uh, it happens when you're a concept artist that they're gonna come back and give you uh, some panels of storyboard and say like, hey, put colors on that. Or, you know, like refine the frame so we know what it should look like. So in general, it's more like the collaborativeness that's important if you want to talk about storytelling, but there are still for, personally, I think there's still very different work in terms of what's the focus yeah okay cool um all right we got a few questions here um one of this maybe we can answer it a bit quickly um is there any reference or benchmark that we can look up for an entry-level concept artist 
or just any level as online sources are very diverse and scattered and most of them are appealing so it's hard to pinpoint I guess general advice on where one can look for um yeah benchmarks for entry level concept art I mean, when I hire uh, when I hire concept artists, I try to look for um, versatility. Um, any artist who can do environment, props, characters, a bit of storyboarding, who exhibits a good understanding of color theory, and who is able to both exhibit sketches in the in the portfolio as well as a final something more key art like. Um, that is something that I look for personally, but as I believe that there is cross pollination in between these different um, uh, in between these different fields. Um, with regard to a benchmark, though, um, I would say ArtStation just in general, because I think ArtStation overall, if if you go on the on the main page and just look at trending or or you look at like the community page, um, there is a good assortment of really really good art um, for an entry level artist um, that might be a little bit of a tall order, but but um, yeah, as I said, you know, like try to try to maintain a good balance, showing versatility um, and showing that you are both fast and good um one of the uh one of the um one of the lessons i learned um from one of my teachers is you first get fast and then you get good because being fast is a prerequisite for actually working properly with with uh, concept art overall it's like nicholas said previously like try to fail as fast as you can um and you don't necessarily need perfect anatomy, perfect perspective, as long as you can communicate the idea. Um, and that is why sketches and uh, an exhibition of your um, ability to fail fast is, um, is something that I at least uh, try to look for when I look for artists. Yeah, well, mostly if I'm just looking at my production because I like mostly to focus on design, I. I often do hundreds of sketches in a, in a month or sometimes half a month, but I'm maybe doing 10 final pieces a year. Um, it, there is like a disproportionate amount of sketches compared to, uh, uh, to what I'm doing like final. And my, my thing with ArtStation sometimes it's, it's often focusing on the final piece yeah, and I'd yeah. like to focus more on the sketch. Um, what, when I started thinking about concept art when I was uh, younger, somebody pointed, like one of the concept artists that was working at a studio that doesn't exist anymore, so it's not important, um, pointed me towards a book that I used to basically learn the learn the trade. And it's, uh, I, right here it's like the, I oh know you cannot see it, it's The Skillful Huntsman. It's a really good book. It's It's kind of, well, mine is yellow now because it's old. Um, but it's a very good book because it's basically students uh, st students doing um, a tale from beginning to the end. So they take a grim tale and they actually just design it into their own world. And you're seeing like all the process that they go from, from sketch mm -hmm. to final. And you can see that most of the drawings are not final. Most of the drawings are not super polished things, but they are um, communicative and very efficient and going for ideas and very diverse. So. In general, this is more of the benchmark that I'm trying to find when I'm when I'm thinking about like good entry level concept artists is are you gonna be able to bring ideas? Because if I want just somebody to draw, then we have that. It's mostly about like what do you bring in a project? Uh, yeah, I'll write I'll write the title in the in the chat too for everybody. It's very old school. I also bought that yeah. book like 12 yeah, 13 book. years ago it's yeah it's, it's, uh, it's old school it's a it's great book it's a great book i mean in general there's a lot of new tools that appeared after that um but i think like the the main logic of the book is still pretty pretty solid um i have a little bit of a thing to add to this for the anonymous attendees question i think if you're looking for entry-level concept artist benchmark um, the I think the benchmark has been raised, you know, compared to 10 years ago, I think like if you were an art student who knew a bit of computer stuff, you get hired uh, much easier 
like 10 years ago or like 15 years ago, you know, when it started. But right now with technology and like Nicodemus mentioned, there's so much 3D and ZBrush and stuff going on. Um, I think the bar has becoming higher now. And if you are looking for the benchmark, I'd, I'd suggest looking at recent graduates um, work. I don't know if you live in Asia or in uh, Europe or North America. North America, like um, on our station, there's like some recent student work and it's getting better and better every year, to be honest. I'm seeing some work that is better than some seniors that I've seen, <laughs> which is uh, quite very, very, like very, very surprising, but people are getting very good. So I suggest looking at recent grads work uh, as well uh, at yeah. DC. Yeah. Yeah. And there's yeah. whatever there's art school of, uh... that's near you, right? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of art schools now because um well i'm pretty sure nico and and me too when we started we there was not really a lot of schools doing concept art so it's mostly something exactly. you kind of discovered by something uh by accident kind of thing so now it, nowadays it's like it's very easy uh Boom. really easy to find like all those those all those schools like in different country different places um mm. so you can go check like what they have yeah i mean sure. overall you know like um when i tried to become a concept artist um there was no youtube there was no tutorials the tutorials that were out were like no mon tutorials which you would have to buy a dvd uh, or or you know uh, try to download at a very super at a super slow speed from from some weird piracy um, website online. But but you know the the amount of stuff out there there was nothing. Um, so you had to sort of rely on what you can find in the immediate vicinity, which at that time at least were people who were oil painters um, and people who were sort of interested in digital media and you sort of formed your idea about what the career was from that perspective these days you know when i go on art station much like nicholas said there's a lot of really really good art out there um but the quality level is so uniform um and sometimes also when you log in it's 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 also quite a little bit dull because everything is starting to sort of look same-ish um which which essentially means that um sure there's a lot of good art there that is really polished that is really well rendered um and and you know people have worked for a long time on but like what you at least what i try to look for is people who who can elaborate on on ideas who can sketch and who has the how should i say the confidence as artists to put up bad sketches because you know like if if every piece in your portfolio is just something you've worked on for a month then that is essentially just a big wall of really polished art that i and i don't have any insights into your actual work process um and you obviously don't feel comfortable in putting anything else than your all the sort of most polished stuff up and for a lot of the situations we encounter in the games industry you won't have a month to work on a specific or or on one single image you know like um it's just it's just not happening um so so having the courage to put up bad work i would say is a at least from my perspective is a it's it's a good sign you know it's a good um it's a good call sign for a good artist. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I agree. I if you if you want to look also like at the the changing the changing world of concept art, you can look at like original uh like the first Star Wars concept art for the costumes. Um it is it is something that we would not even see in student classes anymore. But it it still did the work, but it was just about yeah. like sketches about ideas and that's it like the anatomy was not even part of it uh, nowadays we're asking a lot concept artists to be a little bit of everything which is a good thing because it gives more tools but it's also a problem because it become it's raising the bar all, uh, higher all the time so flexibility and having some kind of vision will always help yeah, yeah. okay we have a few more questions yeah. here so we're going to try and do lightning round um 
Okay, uh, Youngbin Xian has asked, um, even though concept art should be collaborative, however, when there are many people giving opinions, it could become very um, subjective to personal taste. How do you guys handle conflicts and come to a consensus? Uh, so that happens to me a lot. Yeah. <laughs> when I design yeah. characters, you know, everybody wants to say something. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, I don't like this face, or sure. I don't like, yeah. I don't like this body type and stuff. Um, so people would say like, why don't you make it look more like this? And there's a lot of opinions, to be honest. And your job is to listen to those opinions, but you don't have to take in any of those unless it's like, you know, your direct superior. For me, it's the art director. So uh, essentially, like, unless it's someone above him that is giving that opinion you can just listen to it but you don't have to take into account uh, and and it is the art director's job to fend off his like an idea to like creative director like we we want to design it like that because you know this is the ownership like art sites ownership they they kind of define the ownership and then someone takes that decision and you, you can listen to the noises that you hear but you don't you don't need to take it in unless you know the like it's yeah. I think it's from your period. That's it. I guess, yeah. yeah. And in general, I would say that in character concept art, it's it's probably the worst where everybody's telling their bits and pieces. Um, yeah. If you're like doing design props by really committee, often, right? Leave you alone. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like I guess the in in a word, like how do you we how do you differentiate just opinions from things that you should really yeah. um Act it's, on. Yeah. Versus, yeah. I mean, it's a, the main it, client is. it's a constant struggle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the main, I mean, the main client is always yeah. it, it's always the customer, the the people yeah. who will interact with with um, the game you're making. Um, yeah. So, as a concept artist, you have to understand the overall intention and mm. objectives of your work as well, because you gotcha. you are essentially working to 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 push that um objective forwards and whatever supports it you know you can Back. evaluate and, and implement yeah. but if you feel like something is is way too much of a subjective idea on on the work you're doing then well you can ask <laughs> you can ask yeah. the designers if it's logical or or you can um, or you can ignore it yeah, I say that I as though it's that as though it's that simple. It is it's a simple but, but principle. Is, at, but, least, yeah. at least that would be the uh, the overall philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah, makes sense. All right. Um, next question: um, Is concept art the same when telling stories for video games, movies, and other mediums? I I could probably answer that one because I I stretched yeah. around the different ones. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mostly. The, the job is the same, but the, um, the, the way you're approaching each problems is going to be different. For example, when you're doing movies, and Nic Nicodemus touched on it a little bit uh, earlier in the, when, when he was talking, it's when you're doing movies, you're often going to have like a, a, let's say a set plan where you're going to see that thing, it's going to be planned, how you're going to see which angles are going to be shown. But when you're in a game environment, you're going to start seeing all the other sides. So that means you're going to have more work to do on what's the backside, what's happening there, what are those details in case the player wants to interact with it more. Um, in movies, you can decide, oh, this is in the background, so we can spend less time on it. This is in the foreground, we're going to spend more time on it. We're going to just see this angle, so we're just going to take care of that angle. So sometimes there is that kind of, um, um, there, there is that difference. There's also the difference of what is um, what is uh, let's say good details and bad details. Uh, you know, for games, it's all about polygon count. So you're trying to, if you can, you're making things flat, and the detail is just coming from the texture and everything. And then you're like you're basically saving on the polygons. But if you're doing a movie and it's built in props, doing everything flush and like perfect surface, uh, as an example, is really hard for the people doing it because they're doing it in two or three days very quickly in a shop. Um, so you're going to learn to, you know, always put like little dance everywhere, which is gives like a movie that kind of style because it's working a lot with light and shadow. 
and it's trying to never have to adjust like panels too quickly, uh, too precisely. So there's those things, but it's still always the same job. It's just like your parameters are changing. The information is changing of what is important and what is not. Uh, and then like if you're doing animation, then there's a lot of that comes from the stylization. And that's an extra layer of work uh, because like the style of the drawing becomes also influential into the final look of the product, um, which gives more control when you're doing a picture, but also puts more pressure on the artist of what kind of style are you going to approach the design with? Cool. All right. Next question. Um, all right. So this another anonymous attendee is asking, I am wondering if there are stories or part of stories that concept art is unable to tell. Anyone? I would like uh, to. Music. Um... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Nicole. No, no, please. Okay, no, it's, it's like yet again, you know, like it depends on how we think about concept art. Many people think it's a still image, but but um, if we if we expand on the definition of what the actual output is, then it might be you know something you interact with in v in VR, like you um you sculpt you sculpt something in vr for example and then you exhibit it um, in unreal and you can move around and and interact with it um that can also be concept art as long as it sort of stays within that confinement of not being something that is actually supposed to go in the game as a as a final asset um so so within the broader scope um i am sure that uh, there are some, but just to sort of highlight the fact that it's not necessarily always an image that is concept art. We like to think we like to think about about concept art as an image of varying degrees of polish, but but anything can be concept art. Really, uh, it's not it's not tied to um, it's not necessarily tied to. Um, to the format, as long as it informs someone else down the pipeline. Okay. Yeah, um, agreed. I I would add, don't don't tell the clients that it can be an animation because we're never gonna finish. <laughs> <laughs> They're just always gonna ask for animation, basically. Yeah. Um, all right. Cool. Uh, now we're down to our final question by Mr. Joshua Herrera. Uh, a game's cover art is often the hook that gives players their first look into a story of a game. So is concept art a key point to deciding the final box art, or is it just for purposes within the actual game? I guess, how much of an influence do you have in that? Uh, I think it depends. I've seen a concept artist before, uh, Ubisoft, who did the box art. And there were hmm. times where they just asked people to take screenshots of the game and make it pretty or something. So I think it really depends on the company or what representation they want for the game. And also not to be confused, the box art is oftentimes not concept art. It's, a, it's an illustration and they might hire an, a freelance illustrator or an in-house illustrator to do it. And I don't think it has much to do with concept art unless there's a concept artist who has extremely good illustration skills and then they can do it so i think usually it's not super related in my experience yeah because really often you're gonna have um even though like it's very similar it's a little bit of a different set of skills where you're gonna have an illustrator that's able to spend weeks on the same image to really like fine-tune all the details and you also have the the fact that suddenly you have like the marketing department hovering over the whole thing and making sure that it's going to be selling. Right. So they don't, they, they care about the story, they, they care about the design and everything, but their main thing is what's going to sell. And sometimes it's less about what the game really is 100%, but more about like, what are they going to use to bring people in to actually be interested in that? Um, and that is some something that I found really often um, makes it difficult for a lot of concept artists to actually manage because suddenly you have a lot of very important new voices that are just coming into the mix. Um, so most of the games that I know usually have an illustrator for that. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on the process as well. I mean, for some projects I've worked on, um, 
some random sketch somewhere has turned into a concept. That concept has later been used in a design meeting. The designers think that it, you know, expands on the universe in a good way. Um, it's, it's sent back to the concept artist. He's polishing it some more. It reworked. And after two or three years, um, it is a, an image that has been used in enough presentations and it has sort of morphed organically sort of into a suitable piece of cover art. So with regards to the process, you know, like I think, I think it's not as straightforward always as just saying, you know, oh, we're going to hire this specific illustrator to do the cover art because usually you, it's like usually you try to find someone internally because of just the, the amount of experience that particular artist has, has on the project in order to, express the the ideas and core values visually of the project but um i think for some companies it just sort of tends to happen that way um unless it's something super specific or really stylized in in um, um in any specific way so um yeah i think it depends a little bit on the process all right makes sense Okay, that was our final question. So um, we have come to the end of our webinar. Uh, thank you, Nicodemus, Ying, and Nicholas for sharing your experience and insights with us. Um, to you. our audience, <laughs> thank you all. And of course, thanks to our wonderful audience for your questions and for joining us today. Um, if you want to learn more about our panelists, you can find them on ArtStation. And in about a week or so, uh, like I said, this is recorded. We'll be sharing this webinar on our YouTube channel for you to share or we watch if there, you know, if there's a lot of stuff, you know, it's a very meaty webinar, right? So if there's stuff that you want to go back to and um, look into again. So yes, uh, here are their links to their um, art station. And other than that, thank you everyone. And we will see you again at our next Expert Talks webinar. Bye, everyone. <laughs>